Uh, thanks, Jeanette. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Peter, for a, a wonderful um, lecture just earlier this morning. Um, so it, to continue uh, along the theme which Peter was talking about, um, I'm going to focus on a, a couple of slightly different aspects. I'm going to focus on the evolution of consciousness, which is a big subject. It's been going on for millions and millions of years. So it's going to be tricky to squeeze it into 45 minutes, but we'll, we'll see. And um, also, we're going to talk about spiritual awakening or spiritual transformation. So I, I want to make a connection between spiritual awakening and the evolution of consciousness. I'm going to suggest that spiritual awakening is part of the evolution of consciousness, both for us as individuals and for the whole of our species. In fact, not just our species, but in terms of the whole of life on this planet since life began a long, long time ago. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my own spiritual experiences. I'm going to maybe hear a little bit about your spiritual experiences too. There might be a couple of short discussions as we go along. And I'm going to suggest rather optimistically, I'm often accused of being an optimist, as if it's a kind of crime. But, but I think it's quite important to be optimistic, especially at this time in our planet's history, with so many critical processes and events taking place in the world at the moment. So I think it's important to be optimistic. I'm a proud optimist. And um, yeah, I'm going to suggest optimistically that maybe the human race is undergoing an evolution of consciousness right at the moment. And I'm going to suggest some, some evidence for that from my own research. So the core of the talk will be about my own research into spiritual awakening. So as a, as a transpersonal psychologist, uh, I've been a transpersonal psychologist for about 10 years. Transpersonal sort of confuses people. Is anybody familiar with the term transpersonal psychology? No, you're, you're not. Although you are familiar. Yeah, not many people are familiar. So people sometimes come up to me and say, transpersonal psychology, is that something to do with like, transgender? Transgender studies? <laughs> <laughs> is it something to do with like, interpersonal communication? And I say, not really. Uh, no, you could replace the word transpersonal with spiritual. Uh, you could call it spiritual psychology. I guess that the first... Um, transpersonal psychologists in the 1960s in America, they, were, they didn't really want to use the word spiritual because it tends to put off academic people. You know, it immediately sort of sends alarm bells ringing in academia when you say spiritual. So they use the term transpersonal as an alternative to spiritual. And the best way of thinking of transpersonal is trans means beyond, personal means the ego. So it's like beyond the ego. So it's beyond the ego psychology. It's, it's psychology which investigates states of consciousness beyond the normal ego, higher states of consciousness, and also transformational experiences, spiritual experiences of trans, uh, spiritual transformation. So I've been involved in transpersonal psychology for probably 12 years now, and I've done a lot of research on what I call awakening experiences, which are basically, you could say, spiritual experiences. And also I've done a lot of research on ongoing spiritual transformation, not just an experience which is temporary, but an ongoing state of spiritual transformation, when it becomes normal, when it becomes your normal, ongoing, stable state of being. So we'll look, a, a little bit, we'll look at those um, issues a bit later on. But first, I just want to introduce the, the theme of evolution. And a lot of people, when we use the term evolution, a lot, a lot of people just think in terms of physical evolution, the evolution of material forms, the evolution of life forms, that's the standard view of evolution, uh, which is often seen in neo-Darwinian terms caused by random mutations and natural selection. But I, I think it's very important to focus on the inner aspect of evolution. Evolution has an inner aspect. So every time there is a, an increase in complexity in life forms, as, li as living beings become more complex, more better organized, and so on, then there's also an increase in inner evolution. There's an increase in inner awareness or subjectivity. So you can't separate the outer forms of evolution from the inner forms of evolution. And you can think about us human beings, we're maybe, possibly the most complex life forms on the planet. Maybe dolphins may argue with that, maybe whales may have something to say about that. But obviously we, we wouldn't understand it because it would be in some very subtle form of communication which we can't understand. But uh, arguably we're the most complex life forms on this planet with 100 billion brain cells all very intricately interconnected, producing very um, you know, intricate interconnections throughout our body and nervous system. But also you could say that inwardly, we're maybe, arguably again, the most conscious life forms, the most aware 
life forms which are most aware of reality. You can think about a worm, for example. Um, does a worm have any awareness of reality? Maybe to a degree, because a worm will respond to changes in its environment. It will maybe move towards sources of light and food and heat. But does, an inner, does a worm have inner subjectivity in the same way that we do? Maybe not. You know, we, can't tell for, we can't tell for sure. But certainly we human beings have a tremendously complex and deep subjective awareness of our own inner worlds. So, yeah, it's very important to, to make this connection between outer evolution and inner evolution, which you could call, in terms of inner evolution, we could speak about a spiritualization. As living beings become more complex through evolution, they also become more spiritualized, you could say. They become more conscious, more inwardly alive, and more aware of their environment. So just to break that down a little bit more, I think in terms of four different types of awareness that are involved in evolution. First of all, there's simple perceptual awareness, which is an organism's awareness of its surroundings. So every life form has some degree of perceptual or sensory awareness. A worm, even an amoeba, must have some kind of sensory awareness or perceptual awareness because it will move towards sources of heat and light or food. So every animal has that. Every living being has that. But there's also subjective awareness, which we human beings have a very deep and intricate subjective awareness. You know, we can enter our own inner world through meditation or through contemplation, and we become aware of these tremendous depths of subjectivity, the tremendously rich inner life that we human beings have, and which maybe other animals don't have to the same degree. I'm, some, I'm sure some higher animals have some degree of subjective awareness, but maybe not as much as human beings. Then there is intersubjective awareness. And maybe you could say that you know, there are lots of species, particularly insect species, which act as swarms, almost as if they're aware of each other's movements, almost as if they have some sort of intersubjective connection. So intersubjective awareness means a kind of connection between yourself and other living beings. And we human beings have that very strongly. We have a, an empathic connection to each other. We can feel compassion. We can act altruistically towards one another. And yeah, maybe the swarm behavior of some insects is a very simple example of that, some kind of intersubjective connection. And finally, there is what I call conceptual awareness, which is simply our awareness of our surroundings, our awareness of the reality of the world around us, our awareness of the phenomena that we live amongst, uh, our awareness of the natural world around us. And but it's also our understanding of that, how we interpret our awareness of the world around us. So language is a very good, good illustration of conceptual awareness. Language is all about concepts, concepts which explain the world around us. So again, because human language is so intricate, so complex, we obviously have a very high degree of conceptual awareness. A lot of animal, other animals communicate, of course, but their forms of communication are maybe not as complex as human beings. Again, that's arguable. Dolphins, I'm sure, have very complex systems of communications, but it's very difficult for us to conceive of that. So I'm going to move away from that. I'm going to head back to evolution a bit later on. But now I'm going to move into explaining and summarizing some of my research into spiritual awakening. And it really begins, my research really began with myself. You know, we're all our, our own research subjects. Um, can you see if I... Is that there? Is that there? Yeah. So when I was about 16 years old, um, I was quite an unusual 16-year-old, but I was quite a sort of alienated and depressed teenage boy. Um, felt very confused about who I was and what I was supposed to be doing with my life. But every so often, um, I would have these uplifting, euphoric experiences. Usually they happened when I was walking in natural surroundings, maybe in the park or on my school fields. I used to go back to my school fields in the evening just to walk around because I knew it was a place where I could be alone and nobody else would disturb me. But I'd sometimes feel these moments of being uplifted in which all of my depression would seem to fade away. And the trees around me, the sky above me, everything around me seemed to become more alive as if an extra dimension of reality had been added to everything. 
So and everything seems to be somehow interconnected as well. All of these individual phenomena seem to be part of something bigger than themselves, which I couldn't explain. It's very difficult to explain. But there was this sense of sort of harmony that seemed to fill my surroundings. This sense that there was some kind of meaning, which I couldn't describe, but it was there. The sense of harmony and meaning. And also, I no longer felt separate. You know, somehow I felt part of this interconnection around me. I felt as though I was no longer just trapped inside my own mental space. I was part of something bigger outside me. So those experiences were great. They helped me to get through the, the depression of my younger years. But at the same time, I didn't really understand them. You know, I thought maybe they were more evidence that I was crazy because I didn't know anybody else who had these experiences. And I even tried to tell my parents about them, which was a big mistake, because uh, they thought I was strange already. And after that, <laughs> I even overheard them talking about whether to send me to see the doctor or psychiatrist. So immediately I thought, hmm, I'm not going to talk about these experiences anymore, which is a shame, because if, if these experiences were more culturally acceptable, people would no longer feel confused by them. So I didn't really understand these experiences until maybe in my early 20s when I discovered, by chance, a book about mysticism. It was called uh, Mysticism, A Study and an Anthology by F.C. Happold. It's a really great um, anthology and study of mysticism. So when I read this book about mystical experiences, I thought, ah, I recognize these experiences. These are the experiences I have sometimes, or which I had when I was younger. Maybe not as intense as some of the mystics' experiences, but along similar lines particularly the, the experiences of nature mystics. I recognised those experiences in my, amongst my own. So immediately I had a, a kind of a new framework to make sense of my experiences. So immediately I realised I wasn't crazy, or maybe I was crazy, but everybody, all of these other people were crazy too. So, you know, at least I wasn't alone in my craziness. So it was very important for me to have that kind of framework to make sense of my experiences. And years later, uh, at that time I was a musician, I wasn't involved in academia. But years later, when my musical career had come to nothing and ended in disarray, I decided to go back to university. Um, and I found out there was a, a master's degree in transpersonal psychology in Liverpool. I'm from Manchester, so not far away. Liverpool is not far away. So as soon as I discovered transpersonal psychology, I thought, yeah, this is a way that I can understand my experiences. This is a way I can study these experiences. So in my PhD, in my master's degree, in my PhD, and later on in my research, I began to study these experiences, these awakening experiences. I began to collect examples of them and to study the triggers which gave rise to these experiences. And that gave rise to my book, Waking from Sleep, eventually. But I was particularly interested in the, the kind of triggers which give rise to these experiences. Are they just accidental? Are they a, a, a gift of grace from a divine source? Or are they related to certain situations or certain states of mind? That was what I wanted to find out. So I began to ask people this question. And I can ask you, I'll ask you this question now, actually. Have you ever had an awakening experience? That is, a temporary expansion and intensification of awareness. This could be an experience in which your surroundings have become intensely real, when you felt a sense of oneness, sorry, a sense of connection to them, and a deep sense of well-being inside. Or perhaps you have felt a sense that all things are one, and you are part of this oneness. Um, hands up if you've had that type of experience. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, that's good. That's good. I sometimes ask my students at university if they've had this experience. Maybe two or three people put their hands up. But I think they're just shy. You know, uh, They're afraid of being... Um, thought of as being strange. But yeah, these experiences are common, even amongst, we're obviously a distinct group of people here, but even amongst the general population, these experiences are very common. But a bit later on, we'll look at how common, exactly how common these experiences are. But let me give you a couple of um, simple examples from my research of awakening experiences. Um, the first awakening experience here happened to a man who was, um, he was actually in a state of, psychological turmoil at the time, he was, um, he was actually a counsellor at a college where I used to teach. And around this time, around the time of the experience, he, did, he had decided to come out as a, a gay person. He sensed that he was gay and had a, a growing intuition that he needed to come out. But he was married with two teenage kids, so it was obviously a quite a kind of tumultuous, traumatic experience. 
He felt guilty, frustrated and stressed. Um, but in the midst of all this turmoil, he and his family decided to go for one final holiday together as a family. They went to Tunisia. And during the holiday, in the midst of all of his turmoil, he had this powerful awakening experience. So I'll just read the experience. I sat on the sand, on the sand dune, watching the sunset. There were quite a few people around, but it was as if everyone had disappeared, everyone else disappeared. I lost all sense of time. I lost myself. I had a feeling of being totally at one with nature, with a massive sense of peace. I was part of the scene. There was no me anymore. So this transcendence of separateness is quite an important feature of awakening experiences. That's this sense of becoming one with your surroundings, being somehow lifted or uplifted out of yourself and becoming part of, part of something bigger. And also, he said, I lost all sense of time. This sense of sometimes time expands, seems to stretch in these experiences, but often it may seem to just fade away. It no longer seems to, seems to be important. And maybe it no longer seems to exist. So the second one was actually from a child. These experiences are quite common in children. In fact, some research suggests that they're actually more common in children than they are in adults. So this is an experience which a man described in later life, but at the time he was, I think he was six years old, he told me. He was living in Glasgow in Scotland, and he was just running out to play one day, running out of his house, and suddenly he had this powerful spiritual or awakening experience. I looked at the telegraph pole outside of my friend's house. It was pulsating with life and energy. The road surface was the same. I was made up of the same pulsating energy. I lay down, looked up to the sky, and felt the oneness of everything. Felt the earth spinning in its orbit. I seem to know that everything is freshly created in every moment. So this is a, a very powerful awakening experience. Awakening experiences have different levels of intensity. And this is probably one of the highest intensity experiences. This sense that you can, you become aware of the underlying spiritual essence of all things, the underlying spiritual source or energy which pervades everything and which gives rise to the whole world. I think it relates to the idea that, as Peter was saying, consciousness may actually be the source of matter rather than the other way around. So in these kind of experiences, it's almost as if you're becoming aware of the, the, the fundamental consciousness or spirit which underlies everything and which pervades everything. But unfortunately, there is a, there is a kind of sad aftermath of this, um, this story, because he made the mis same mistake which I did, which was telling his parents about it. So as I said, he was only six at the time. So he had a, so if you have any spiritual experiences, don't tell your parents about them. That's very important. <laughs> Even if your parents are very old, in their 80s or 90s, you still don't tell them, unless they are spiritually aware, which hopefully they may be. But um, yeah, th this gentleman, he had a few other experiences along similar lines. He told his parents, and his parents you know, were a bit concerned. They told the doctor. The doctor told the psychiatrist. I think this was in the 80s. And the psychiatrist gave him medication, which is very unfortunate. Um, so, you know, that's a, unfortunately, a lot of psychiatrists do not understand spiritual experiences. Uh, I think there's a, a growing awareness amongst psychiatrists of spiritual experiences, but a lot of people, a lot of psychiatrists immediately write them off as uh, anomalous, borderline psychotic experiences, which is a shame, but hopefully it's changing. So as I said, w the thing I was really interested in was trying to find out what situations give rise to these spiritual experiences. So... I'm going to mention a few triggers which I found, a few important triggers. And actually, I'd, li I'd actually like um, to know what you think. Um, maybe you could think about which of these triggers, it, maybe in your own experience, you could think about your own, ex your own spiritual experiences or awakening experiences. Which of these triggers do you think in the general population would be the most significant trigger of awakening experiences? Which of these tr situations would most frequently give rise to these experiences.
So contact with nature is the first one. You know, we have romantic poets like Wordsworth and Shelley, Coleridge, who talked about these kinds of experiences in nature. Spiritual practice, you'd expect that meditation or yoga would be strongly connected with these experiences. Watching or listening to an arts performance, uh, so that could be in a theater, watching a play at a, at a concert, watching a musical performance, psychological turmoil, stress or depression, reading spiritual literature or ingesting psychedelic substances, whatever they may be. Um, but yeah, we're obviously thinking about LSD, ayahuasca, DMT, which I'm sure none of you have ever taken. <laughs> But um, yeah, just maybe, maybe just for one minute, just have a word with the person who's sitting next to you, just for two minutes, and just decide which of these triggers do you think is most frequently associated with awakening experiences? And also maybe your own experiences. Um, so what do you think then? Um, let's just go through, we'll go through one or two of these. Who thinks that contact with nature is probably the most significant trigger of these experiences? And who would also say in their own experience, in your own life, which would you say that contact with nature has been the most significant trigger? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think there's definitely a relationship between nature and these experiences. How about spiritual practice? Who thinks that is, in the general population, maybe the most significant trigger? Mm -hmm. Just a few. Uh, watching or listening to an arts performance, has anybody ever had that kind of experience in that situation? And thinks it's a significant trigger? Mm -hmm. uh, also, playing music or participating in creati creative activities is also a big, big source. Singing, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, or playing a musical instrument as well. Uh, what about psychological turmoil? Who thinks that maybe psychological turmoil is the most significant trigger? Yeah, in the general population. Okay, reading spiritual literature. Mm-hmm. And ingesting psychedelic substances. Yeah. <laughs> Go on, don't be afraid, just... Don't be afraid of admitting that you've ingested psychedelic substances. Um, anyway, yeah, let's see what my research uh, has, has found. I've actually done two studies of... The first study was 150 awakening experiences. And the last study was of 90 awakening experiences. So I worked with a, a research assistant to analyse the experiences, and one of the things we tried to find out was which is the most significant trigger? What is the most common situation which gives rise to these experiences? And we found that psychological turmoil was the, the biggest trigger. Um, so out of 90 experiences, uh, 37 were related to psychological turmoil. I guess the one I read out just recently about my friend who was a counsellor on holiday in Tunisia, that's a good example of a, uh, how psychological turmoil can give rise to this powerful ecstatic experience. And uh, yeah, there were many variations of this, stress, depression, loss, bereavement. Uh, combat, even combat, you know, I, I, I have some reports from soldiers who had powerful awakening experiences where they were engaged in battle situations. Uh, so in some ways it doesn't seem to make sense. You know, why does intense psychological turmoil have this power to give rise to these amazing ecstatic experiences of oneness and uplift and euphoria? But maybe it suggests that, you know, that there isn't such a duality between turmoil and joy, or between depression and joy. Maybe in some ways, these polar opposites are not actually dualistic. Maybe in some ways they are interconnected. Um, so yeah, that was a surprise to me. I didn't expect psychological turmoil to be such a powerful trigger of these experiences. But they were, yeah, I collected many very inspiring and moving examples of these experiences related to turmoil. And nature, yeah, so nature was also a significant trigger, 23 out of 90. Um, spiritual practice, meditation, prayer, yoga, spiritual literature, love, uh, watching or listening to an arts performance. So that came up three times, not very significant. So the, the main triggers were the top four, uh, psychological turmoil, nature, and spiritual practice. I think one thing that this suggests is, I think Peter mentioned this earlier, that these kind of experiences, you know, sometimes they're related to spiritual practices or to religious frameworks, but often they occur outside traditional spirituality, outside traditional religion. Often they occur in a kind of secular setting in the midst of everyday life. Uh, so, you know, I, I think of them as part of our innate capacity as human beings. These experiences are potentially available to all of us, no matter what our situation is, no matter what our beliefs are. They are part of our 
inner potential, if you like. So I'm going to move on to a different area of my research now, which I'll just discuss briefly. And this is when I began to realise through doing, doing this research that some people were not just having awakening experiences. They weren't just having temporary experiences of awakening. They were actually shifting into a permanent ongoing state of wakefulness, I'd call, I call it. So they were actually undergoing a, a permanent shift of consciousness or a permanent shift of being, which then became stable and permanent. So I began to research permanent wakefulness, not just temporary experiences, but permanent wakefulness. And this, um, I wrote about this, in, I put this research together in my book, The Leap. And permanent wakefulness is obviously related to awakening experiences. It has many of the same characteristics, but they are established on a permanent basis. They don't fade away, they remain as part of a person's ongoing state. And it's really, you could define it as a, a state of intensified and expanded awareness. A person who exists in this state they have an intense perceptual awareness. The world around them looks very real, very vivid, very beautiful. <clears throat> but also they have a, an intense degree of inner awareness. They're aware of the richness and the depths of their own inner being, which they can experience, maybe just by closing their eyes or maybe by meditating. But they're aware of the tremendous richness of their own inner experience. And also they have, they have an intense awareness of their own connection to other people. They have an intense sense of empathy, compassion, and as a result, they are often very altruistic. They're not so concerned with accumulating things for themselves, like accumulating possessions or wealth or power. They're more interested in being altruistic towards other people. So there's a, there is a shift from accumulation to contribution, you could say. A shift from materialism to altruism. And I think, again, I think this is a natural human potential. It's described in different ways in different spiritual traditions around the world. But essentially, it's a natural human potential, which can be experienced outside the context of spiritual traditions. But sometimes in spiritual traditions, it's called Sahaja Samadhi, which is, Samadhi means ecstasy in Sanskrit. But in the Hindu philosophical tradition, Sahaja Samadhi is when it becomes ongoing and stable and normal to a person. And maybe in the Christian tradition, Ming is from Taoism, which is an equivalent state in Taoism. Maybe in the Christian tradition, it may be called theosis, uh, when you become one with the divine or experience the divine as part of your own being and so forth. So there are many equivalent terms for this in spiritual traditions, but essentially, I think it is outside spiritual traditions. <laughs> So I'll give you a couple of examples. I think there are three ways in which people can shift into this state of ongoing wakefulness. The first is when it's uh, natural, when a person does not have to undergo any kind of sudden transformation. They don't have to follow any spiritual paths or practices in order to create this wakefulness. It just happens to be their normal state of being. They're, you know, they're, they, they're born with it, they retain it, and it becomes, maybe it becomes intensified or it develops through their lives. But I think there were a lot of poets and artists who lived in this state, particularly poets like w William Wordsworth, who talked a lot about awakening experiences. Walt Whitman, he's my favorite poet of all time, the great American poet. I was actually thinking about what, Walt Whitman during Peter's talk, because um, there's a great poem of Walt, Walt Whitman's called, To One Shortly to Die. And I can't remember the exact lines, but Walt Whitman was, uh, for a time, he was a nurse during the Civil War in America in the 1850s, I think it was, or 40s or 50s. So he describes the situation where he's, he's at the bedside of a soldier who's dying, a young man who's been fatally injured and is dying. And the bed is surrounded by weeping and wailing relatives. And Walt Whitman says something like, I wait for everybody to go, and then I clasp your hand, and I do not commiserate with you, I congratulate you. So he's, you know, he's aware that death is a kind of liberation and he wants to pass on this um, positive, liberating feeling. So yeah, I think there were a lot of artists too, maybe like Turner, people like Monet or Turner had a glimpse of this ongoing wakefulness too. 
But I think probably the most, the most common way in which it's developed is when it's gradual, when people cultivate wakefulness through spiritual practices. So there are millions of people, billions maybe, of people around the world who follow spiritual practices, who follow spiritual paths, like the Eightfold Path of Buddhism, the Kabbalah, the Path of Yoga, and so on. And they're all cultivating a more expansive and intensified awareness. They're all trying to transform themselves into a state of wakefulness. And it will happen if you follow a spiritual practice assiduously for a long time, you will undoubtedly begin to experience a more expansive awareness. You will undoubtedly begin to experience some degree of wakefulness. But the most interesting way in which this state can occur is when it happens suddenly and dramatically. And that's one area I focused a lot on in my research, is cases where wakefulness has arisen very suddenly and dramatically. And that usually happens through intense psychological turmoil. Um, I sometimes refer to it as post-traumatic transformation. Uh, maybe you've heard of post-traumatic growth, some of you? Have anybody heard of post-traumatic growth? Post-traumatic growth is quite a well-known concept in psychology. It's that trauma can, in the long run, have positive after-effects. It can develop, a, even if it takes years to develop, a lot of people who go through trauma develop positive after-effects. They develop a, a set, deeper sense of appreciation, a deeper sense of meaning. Uh, their relationships become more intimate and satisfying, and so on. So post-traumatic growth is very common, but I call this, this transformational experience post-traumatic transformation because it often follows a bereavement, a diagnosis of cancer, uh, a, an experience of addiction, a period of intense stress or depression. And when I began to do my research, I was amazed at how many cases I found of people who were in a, a really intense state of suffering because they'd lost everything, you know, they'd lost their partner, they were potentially going to die because they'd been diagnosed with cancer, or maybe they'd lost everything through addiction, through alcoholism. They were really at rock bottom, as, a, as if everything had been stripped away. Everything they depended on for their well-being had been taken away. Um, maybe it's a little bit like the process of dying where we have to let go. We have to let go of all of, the, of our attachments. In these situations, people are often forced to let go of their attachments. They're forced to let go of their attachments to the future, to their attachments to success or achievement or status. All of these things are let go. And it may bring a, an experience of sudden transformation. Obviously, it doesn't always happen, but in some cases, it, you know, it actually does happen. The way I explain it is that I think psychological attachments, whether they are to ambitions or to the future or to a sense of status or to a sense of identity, to a role that you play within the world, or to possessions or to wealth, I think of those as the, the building blocks of the ego. They give you a sense of identity. You feel like you are a strong person because you have all these attachments. But when you go through a period of intense turmoil, these attachments are slowly taken away. The building blocks are slowly taken away and as, at a certain point, the ego collapses. Your sense of identity completely collapses. Just like a house collapses when you, you know, if you take enough bricks away, the house will collapse. So I think that's what happens. But in some people, obviously for many people, that's just an experience of intense trauma and breakdown. And you know, there are no positive aspects at all. But in a minority of people, it's almost as if there is something new waiting to be born inside them. A kind of, I sometimes call it a latent higher self, which seems to be ready to be born, just like a bird when it's ready to hatch. But it sometimes takes the breakdown of the normal ego for that hatching to take place, for a new self to emerge. So it really is like a, like a phoenix arising from the ashes or like a butterfly uh, emerging from a chrysalis. I could carry on with poetic metaphors, if you like. But um, yeah, it's a tremendous experience of regeneration out of, the, out of the darkness of turmoil and suffering. And like I say, I'm amazed in my research. E even now, almost every week, somebody writes to me to tell me that they've had a similar experience. And often there are people who don't know anything about spirituality or spiritual practice or spiritual traditions. They're, you know, they're seemingly ordinary, in inverted commas, people in everyday life who don't have any kind of background in spiritual practices. And sometimes it's difficult for them to understand what's happened to them. Sometimes they're a little bit confused, even though they feel so, 
liberated and they have a sense of meaning and a new sense of joy. But there, there, there is often a sense of confusion. And if, if they're not careful, that confusion can actually grow. And um, so they, they, they really need to develop a framework to make sense of their experiences. That's very, very important. Usually they do because they gravitate towards spiritual teachings, spiritual practices, and they think, oh, wow, this explains what's happened to me. But until then, there is, there is often a sense of confusion. That's why it's very important for people to have support when they go through these kind of spiritual awakenings. They can also be a little bit disturbing. You know, they, when they're very powerful and dramatic, they can sometimes cause disturbances to your normal mind. You know, they can cause problems with concentration, memory. They can make it difficult to, to function in the world, to, you know, to interact with other people and to do your job. So, you know, but, the, the, but the, the confusion and the disturbance does normally fade away eventually. I think of it as like a, like a slow motion earthquake, an earthquake that's in incredibly slow motion. Obviously, it causes disturbance to the ground, to your psyche. But eventually, you know, the ground settles again, even if it takes months or even years in some cases. I actually, in, one, in my research, there was one guy who had a spiritual awakening 10 years ago, and he was still kind of dealing with the, the after effects of it. He was still struggling a little bit to integrate it into, everyday, into his everyday self. So I just want to go back to the topic of evolution now, um, which I spoke about at the beginning. So I think these experiences are connected to evolution. In, in, in awakening experiences when they're temporary and also in ongoing wakefulness when it's continuous, there is a sense that our awareness is expanding in all of these ways, in perceptual ways, in terms of intersubjectivity, that's our connection with other people. Also, in terms of our own inner world, our inner, inner awareness expands and deepens as well. And also, even conceptually, we have this kind of richer and deeper and fuller understanding of the world. Often, in terms of conceptual um, issues, there's a shift from a kind of, to a kind of global perspective. People no longer think in terms of nationality or ethnicity or how they are different to other people. They sense a kind of common connectedness with the whole human race. And they feel a sense of empathy towards other human beings, even if they may seem superly, superficially different. So there's a, there's a shift away from that kind of group identity. A, a good example, which I'll just talk about briefly, was a couple of guys in my PhD research who were uh, football fans. They were big fans. Of, I think one of them was a fan of Leicester City. One of them was a big fan of Brighton Hove Albion. Albion. Then they had this spiritual awakening, and they were no longer football fans. <laughs> but, but they still liked football, they liked watching the game, but they, they no longer felt identified with a particular club. One guy said that it was difficult because he wanted both teams to win, <laughs> which I guess is a draw. A draw would be a, a fair result. So yeah, I think these experiences are part of the evolutionary process. If you like, you could think of them as a kind of a glimpse of a, a higher phase of evolution, the next phase of evolution, if you like, a kind of the part of that process of expanding awareness, which has begun which began millions of years ago with the simplest life forms and has expanded through all other life forms towards human beings. And I think in spiritual experiences, we are continuing that process. We're expanding awareness. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that time is running short. Like a lot of spiritually minded people have no sense of time. Unfortunately, time is quite useful sometimes. Like Einstein said, time is a useful illusion. So, um, so yeah, I'll, I'll try to just mention a couple of other things very briefly. These, these are other questions I could ask you. I, I, th I think I know the answer to these questions, actually. Have you ever felt a deep sense of spiritual peace and well-being? Do you sometimes feel a deep sense of wonder about the universe? Have you ever experienced a presence or power, whether you call it God or not, which is different from your everyday self? I think most of you have probably had these type of experiences, at least once. But how many people in terms of percentage do you think have had these experiences at least once in their lives? I'll just ask you that question briefly. If you like, just for, just for literally one minute, you could speak to the person next to you. How common do you think these experiences are amongst the, the general population? So the, these are questions which, um, which have been asked um, many times in surveys. The first two are from American surveys. The second one is from a survey that which has been carried out many times in this country uh, to try to find out how common these experiences are amongst the general population. 
Um, so what do you think then? Think, the first question, have you ever felt a deep sense of spiritual peace and well-being? I guess that means at least once in your life. What do you think, a third? Or maybe a third of the general population or more? You think more, maybe a half? Yeah, half? Okay. Do you sometimes feel a deep sense of wonder at the universe? Everyone. Everyone? Yeah? Yeah, that's a more general kind of question. I guess a lot of scientists who, are not, who would not call themselves spiritual people have had that kind of experience. A lot of scientists say that they are even Richard Dawkins. Should I say even Richard Dawkins? <laughs> doesn't he live near here? Oh, no, he lives in Oxford, doesn't he? Um, I sometimes have this nightmare that Richard Dawkins would turn up at one of my talks. <laughs> I'd probably just run out of the door. Um, I did go to one of his talks for the first time last year, but I'll tell you about that another time. <laughs> um, yeah, well, actually, it's an interesting way of dealing with questions because he, people put their hands up at the end of his talk, and somebody asked... Obviously, there was a religious person who asked a kind of religiously tinged question, and he just said, bollocks. <laughs> and that was it. That, he, that was the extent of his answer, and he... Next question. So, <laughs> so it's, an it's a good method of dealing with questions, uh, <laughs> difficult questions. Um, so, yeah, have you ever experienced the presence of power, whether you would call it God or not, which is different from your everyday self? So maybe something like a half or a third? Yeah, so we, we all agree that these, these, these experiences are pretty common. But what, I, what I think is really interesting is that the surveys show that these experiences are, are actually becoming more common or well, they're actually being reported more openly. Uh, so a deep sense of spiritual peace and well-being from 52 to 59% in that period, in, in a seven-year period. A deep sense of wonder about the universe, that's fairly small, actually 39%, but it's increased to 46%. A presence of power, uh, so from 1969 to 1987, it increased from 29% to 48%. I'm not aware of any more recent. This is from the Alistair Hardy Trust. It was a survey which they used, but I'm not sure if it's been repeated since then. But is that, you know, is that possible that spiritual experiences are becoming more common? Is that possible, do you think? Yeah. Or maybe they've always been there, but people are talking more openly about them. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I guess my, I said before I'm an optimist. My optimistic interpretation of this phenomenon is that the experiences are actually becoming more common. People are actually finding it easier to have these experiences. Maybe it's partly because these experiences are more culturally acceptable than they used to be 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, they're more, they're part of the common currency of our culture now. You know, with people like Eckhart Tolle and many other spiritual teachers who are very well known now. These people are making these experiences more acceptable. So maybe people always had them, but they're, they're talking about them more openly. But I think, I think maybe you, you could suggest that there is some kind of collective spiritual transformation taking place. This is, you know, when I get super optimistic. You know, there are many negative trends taking place in the world. I don't need to talk about them. You're all painfully aware of them. But I think there are, there are positive, trends as well, positive trends as well. I think spiritual experiences are possibly becoming more common. I think more people are following spiritual paths and practices than they used to. I heard one sociologist say that this is the most important cultural trend of our time, that more people are getting interested in self-development and spiritual practices and paths more than any, any other time in our history. And this is what I found from my research. I'm, I'm always amazed at how common the experiences of people shifting into a spiritual state, an ongoing spiritual state, uh, in the midst of intense turmoil. I just have this feeling that it's somehow much more common than most people believe. Mainly because a lot of people who have this experience don't talk about it because they don't really understand it. But I have this feeling that it's happening more and more frequently. And you could say well, what is happening is that there is a kind of latent higher self in individuals which, which seems to unfold in times of intense crisis when people feel that a new self is born inside them. But maybe you could apply that to a whole species too. I think the present phase of the human race is a phase of discord. You know, we're living in a state of discord collectively and individually, most people individually. But I think there is something beyond that. I think there is a new phase which may be arising slowly. I think something is slowly emerging within hum the human race collectively. And maybe you could say it's a, a higher self, a kind of latent higher self, or maybe a new level of consciousness which we're slowly progressing towards. And 
one way of looking, I use the metaphor of water. It's almost as if, you know, just in the same way that a water level rises and manifests itself in different ways in lakes, bigger lakes, more and more pools of water rising everywhere. So all of these phenomena, they seem to be suggesting that something new is arising, a new kind of awareness is arising. The individual awakening experiences, which seem to become becoming more common, the shift which more and more, more people are undergoing in intense turmoil, the shift into a higher state of awareness, the pull that more and more people feel towards spiritual practices and traditions. Maybe there are, they are a sign that something new is arising in the collective being of the human race. And obviously, you know, we need this new awareness. The human race cannot continue indefinitely in our present state of discord and separation and conflict. We, knew, we need a new sense of interconnection, a new sense of responsibility for the world. We need a new state of awareness in order to survive as a species. I don't think we're gonna survive as a species unless we collectively develop a new level of awareness. So let me just end with a, um, a picture. My son told me about three years ago, he said, oh, I've had a dream, I had a really good dream last night, Dad. And I said, oh, great, great, describe it to me. And he said, well, it's difficult to describe, I'll draw a picture. So he drew a picture of a butterfly emerging from the world. The world broke like an egg, and a butterfly emerged. Uh, so this is his, draw his actual drawing for my son. The world is breaking into, and a butterfly is arising. So I think maybe that's a good symbol for what's happening in the world at the moment. The world seems to be breaking down in some ways, but I think, you know, a butterfly of a new awareness is slowly arising. And maybe it will arise, maybe it won't arise in time before negative events come to fruition. But I think, you know, we, it could be as a result of the crises we're facing. The crises we face collectively could be having an awakening effect. I was saying to somebody last night that Donald Trump, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to mention Donald Trump, <laughs> but... Um, there's a phenomenon in Buddhism called the negative bodhisattva. A bodhisattva is normally a being of light that helps human beings to, to evolve and to develop spiritually, to spiritually awaken. But sometimes there is a negative bodhisattva who is actually an evil being, a demonic being, but he helps... And I'm not going to you know, tell you about my political affiliations, but, but you can probably guess. But, um, yeah... Somebody like Donald Trump, you know, he causes a lot of suffering and discord, but maybe that's helping us to awaken. Maybe the negative bodhisattva spurs us on to awakening through causing difficulty and suffering. That's the idea in Buddhism, and maybe it applies to, to us in the world today. So maybe just in the same way that individuals who encounter death sometimes undergo awakening process, maybe collectively, because we are facing serious threats, that's spurring on our awakening as a species. And I think we all have a responsibility. You know, I think our own individual efforts to awaken affect the whole species. Whatever you do in your own life, whatever path of spirituality you follow in your own life, you need to do that not just for yourself, but the, for the whole human species. Because your own efforts to awaken will make it easier for the whole human race to awaken. Because after all, we are deeply connected. And our own consciousness affects... Yeah, I'm... I'm literally on my last sentence. Um, sorry. So yeah, our own consciousness permeates and affects the consciousness of the whole human race. So, thank you. Thank you.